Welcome to After School Democracy, the podcast that attempts to fill in the gaps you almost certainly missed in school about politics, economics, and history. However, today I'm going to move over from my politics hat to something that is tangentially political. Because of my day job, I'm actually a microbiologist. Today we're going to answer the claim by Marianne Williamson, Are We the Sickest Generation Ever? I've been meaning to do this before she dropped out of the race, but life got in the way. So... Are we the sickest generation, as Marianne Williamson and anti-vaxxers like to claim? Short answer is no. Long answer is no. The levels of autism diagnosis have risen ridiculously. The levels of obesity and type 2 diabetes are spiking massively. ADHD is through the roof. Food allergies are plaguing many, many children. We have diseases we never even heard of that now ravage the nation. How can we not be the sickest generation? It really comes down to the fact that thanks to vaccinations, which Marianne Williamson has denigrated and added to their denialism by using the fake pretend centrist line of parental choice, as well as good medical care, the EPA and higher fortified food, we have winnowed down the most deadly diseases that plagued us for centuries. Childhood deaths are the lowest in all of human history. Until the early 1900s, three-fifths of your kids were going to die from some form of childhood illness. Thanks to modern medicine, we are keeping kids alive that would have been killed off by natural selection, which isn't a bad thing, as I discuss in the link below. Think of it like carving a sculpture. With diseases, you target the hardest areas first, carving off big chunks. After that, you can focus better on the finer details. Every layer, the detail gets finer and finer. We now have more detection methods and treatments that people just lived with to their long-term detriment because we were way too busy fixing immediate short-term problems. Our kids are the healthiest in human history, and a little more healthy as the pre-agrarian civilizations in spite of the fact that the infant mortality rate to weed out the weaker genes is microscopic. We can just finally focus on minor long-term issues that aren't life-threatening that we didn't have the resources to deal with in the past. Take, for example, fluoride. It's considered by the science community as one of the top 10 things that saved lives in the 1900s. Tooth infections could be very deadly. Now that fluoride toothpaste is easily available and fluoride in bottled drinks are so common, the CDC has issued its reduction. They're weighing removing it from water entirely in areas where it's no longer needed and possibly eliminating it in its entirety in most of the Western world. It served us well in the 1900s, but now that we need it less and less, we're finding it may actually have some slight impact on IQ. By 2025 to 2030, the CDC may well just have it removed entirely, pressing people to just use toothpaste and mouthwash. But just like with mercury sulfa antibiotic drugs, it was a choice between lowered IQ and death, so you went with lowered IQ. Obesity and type 2 diabetes are rising as well all over the world. This is a mix of factors, but it is combined by two things. The fact that people used to starve to death and be malnourished, and the military needs affordable shelf-stable foods. Therefore, the USDA has created a massive food science lab that produce cheap, nutrient-packed, shelf-stable foods. Because of all this backing and certain laws that were meant to curb corn and soy growth, that ended up being abused and exploited to actually make tons of money and grow ridiculously more corn and soy than were needed, so the prices dropped and we crammed them into foods that shouldn't have them. It's why the soy boy idea is a complete joke, because if you eat any processed food, you're binging on soy. So because of this exploited law, as well as exploited farm aid laws, mega companies who own large farms and factory farms only grow corn, wheat, and soy to feed their factory farm meat and milk producers, while small and mid-sized farmers can go bankrupt. And vegetable and fruit growers get almost no subsidies and are considered specialty crops, so only immigrants with exchange rates from other nations can afford to work for such low picking prices. Food deserts make weight easy to gain, but nutrition hard to gain. Health foods are quite a lot more expensive than junk food. However, the structure was made to serve three purposes. End starvation, stop easy-to-prevent vitamin deficiency diseases, and ensure shelf-stable food for the troops. No one is dying from starvation, getting scurvy or rickets, or going blind from vitamin A deficiencies in the U.S., they accomplished all of these goals that used to plague us all the time. Now the incentives need to change so that the public transit is more reliable, food deserts get populated with better, healthier food, healthy food costs the same or is cheaper than junk food, and people have more free time to cook for themselves. The military is already working on ways to make healthier, shelf-stable food for the troops, and that subsidized research is slowly trickling out to the population. 
Back in the day, we relied on manual labor with zero ergonomics and poor safety standards and ridiculous amounts of people suffered chronic pain, injury, or death from just working. Now we're much more sedentary, and our labor requires much less physical and more mental effort, leading to, along with stress of poverty and lack of exercise, more mental health problems. While more money for amount worked is good incentive for the physical labor slash industrial model, it's a terrible incentive system for the mental heavy jobs. So long as you are financially comfortable, you will put just as much effort into the job, and more time off actually leads to better productivity and mental health, and less mistakes. Now we don't get the exercise we need, especially when we're being underpaid and exhausted, so obesity and sedentary-related diseases are up. But thanks to no longer doing backbreaking labor, we no longer end up with extreme arthritis and being hunched over in pain in our old age nearly as much. And lastly, food allergies. Back in the day, if you had a food allergy, you would have just died as a baby when introduced to solids and people just assumed it was normal. Now, since they don't die, and we no longer have parasites that the IgG antibodies evolve specifically to attack, it thinks parts of the body or food are parasites and goes after them. It's why there is correlation to owning pets and lower asthma, and not over-sanitizing your house that is a modern luxury and should be used during periods when there are pandemics, but we have to give the immune system something to fight so it won't turn on you when pandemics aren't a problem. So are we the sickest generation ever? Heck no, we have the lowest child mortality and lower deadly hospital diseases than ever in history. Part of the way to fix that, unfortunately, did include creating more chronic diseases, but also babies not dying in infancy didn't weed out certain chronic diseases, and now we have time, energy, and resources to diagnose chronic conditions that just went untreated or were treated with alcoholism like most mental health issues. We are the healthiest we have ever been in the modern agrarian life, but we need to change the system to get ourselves to peak health and eliminate these transition diseases that replace mass fatality and malnutrition. Marianne Williamson is correct, at least in that sense, but everything is relative and it shows a complete lack of understanding of medical history, if you really believe we are the sickest generation ever. So thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. I'm sure there was nothing controversial about this and everyone will happily get along in the comments section, which you can do on the YouTube version of this video or my Facebook page, After School Democracy. Link in the show notes. Just a reminder that I'm Anubis2814 on YouTube and I have over 500 videos on different topics that I've made over the past 10 years. Please subscribe and if your podcast site has the option, give me a like or review. If you think what I have to say informed you, consider supporting my Patreon. I'll be doing this podcast weekly and try to get it out on the same day, so I hope to see you here next week, ready to be filled with new ideas. Take care. This channel is helped tremendously by the generous supporters on Patreon. A big thank you to the wonderful Joe Taylor, Elias Garcia Guevara, and Ogrel for their support at the $10 a month Wapawet level. Please consider donating to my work if you can, and thank you all for listening.